like a hyperplane for each, like n dimensions hyperplane, so for one for each, right? Class C is epsilon delta learnable. And for every C along the CN. So I'm going. Uh, so there exists a large what is this? Where we see in the end is the section. So, to read this, so a class is epsilon delta learnable for the uniform distribution. If there exists a learning algorithm uh, such that for every unknown group, it gets random examples from uh, all the uniform distribution. Sorry, not just one, but yeah, this, this is uh, a random example of. It gets data points, uniform data random, and it's labeled. So we call this a random example. Okay? So A gets these samples, and then uses this to output a hypothesis which can predict the behavior of any unknown C with probability at least one minus delta. And when I say it predicts the behavior of C, I mean to say that. The number of places where it makes an error with respect to the uniform distribution is very small, which is absolute. Yeah, this is here. Right. And now we also consider uh, stronger models of learning where uh, instead of Just having a random example of it. The learning algorithm also gets query access to the underlying targets. You can ask for a, an example and then get CFX. And now, once I output a hypothesis, which is, which has a more subsidized. And also, this is probably one of the step back. So, this is a stronger model in the sense your algorithm can actually query certain special points, which it feels can capture the underlying function better. Like in this case, you only get random samples from the underlying data set. And it's really, whereas in, this, uh, in the membership query model, so it's called membership query model. Yeah. So you can ask the queries and it gives you the data. And you can ask like points which you feel are like boundary points, points which have some special structure. And yeah, intuitively this already seems quite more powerful than just having random examples. And there are also like formal separations under uh, like cryptographic assumptions. But so this so we also will need this model of random example article in Hamish. 
And now, going back to delegation system. Okay, this is a computation mass, which we focus on. Uh, uh, going back to the delegation setting, can we delegate learning tasks to the server and uh, check the accuracy of its hypothesis computation? Right. So before going there, uh, it's worth understanding what it means for an efficient learner. Right. So one could talk about samples of queries, or just the running time itself, and learner is said to be just the length, the size of the underlying concept, the target, one over epsilon and one over delta. And we can talk about samples, queries, or running time. I mean, depending on uh, what results you want to put, you can consider any of these as the resources you want to make. Uh, yeah, and the, yeah. So this is, this theory has been the very foundation to uh, understanding the computation complexity of learning tasks themselves. Yeah. So now consider the setting where. Uh, I want to delegate certain learning tasks to the server and the following one. This is my, this is me, I call myself as you. And this is the server, I call it as you. Now I have a random example of them. And P as a And potentially could also have more computation resources. So now I want to delegate. I want to learn this class C using random examples. But since my very only has a random example access, which is a weaker model, and also has very few resources, it might not be able to do so. I'm calling it verifier. This is currently, just think of it as a client. Client is sort of. So let's delegate this task. And now I want someone to give me the hypothesis back or convince me that can actually perform said learning task. But the server could be nice, trying to help learn the function itself, but it could also be. Trying to fool me. It could be someone sitting in the basement and trying to send a really bad hypothesis, trying to convince me that this hypothesis is a correct one. So, how do I actually prove, uh, convince myself that the hypothesis is the correct one? So, to this, we consider the setting of interactive groups. But before going there, uh, I'm going to say in this model, we have an easy answer. Uh, does anyone want to log of one of yeah. Epsilon tests? Sorry? We do log of one of Epsilon or something? Or oh, yeah, one yes, of yeah. Or this one of one of one of yeah. And why is that? So the server just sends your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And you draw. Uh, enough number of random examples and take an empirical estimate of how many times. So you get x and zero times, and you get a hypothesis, compute it of x, and you check on how many of these they are wrong. Mm -hmm. And now, if this was if the error of the most epsilon, in these many samples, I can check uh, if uh, it is close to epsilon. 
And if the error was much further away from epsilon, then I can also figure out whether the estimated error is larger than that. So I can distinguish between those three two cases. And I'm done. So yeah, in this setting, this model actually becomes easy. So you can actually verify this uh, quite cheaply. So now uh, we move to a more general form of learning. But before that, this is the setup here. Right. Okay. So instead of pattern learning analysis, we're going to look at a more general version of this called. Agnostic learning. Maybe change to red. Sorry? Maybe change oh. to red. Ah. So, a class, uh, C is epsilon delta so before going let me try to motivate what agnostic learning is so until now we assumed that the unknown group has some ground truth associated and what is that here is that the fact that it is a hyperplane we know that's a hyperplane, and we're trying to learn with respect to the fact that it's a hyperplane. But in more general and potentially more realistic settings, the underlying rule does, would not have such a structure. It could be any, it could just be function. So, me and it has also structure. So, how do you deal in the such scenarios? This is captured by the notion of agnostic learning, where instead of there being ground rules to unknown rules, as a learner, you fix your own ground rules. As in, you just say, All right, I mean, I've seen all these data sets which have half spaces, separate them somehow. I just assume this also can be separated by a But then, as a learner, it could be extremely wrong. As one can see here. Uh, so, what my task now becomes is to find a hypothesis which is as close as possible to the best that I can achieve in hypotheses. Does that make sense? I'll just maybe try to define this more formally. Uh, yeah. Might make things seem clear. Uh, So now we have an arbitrary Boolean function, which could be from anywhere. And you're getting, again, random examples where x is uniformly drawn from the distribution of 0 to the end. And you have f of x. Right. You're getting these examples. And now, the goal here is to output a hypothesis which has an error. And at most, opt. Uh, 
for all functions that exist in this category. For all functions, C probability A. Sample so, X from the end of distribution. Let's see what happens. So, mm -hmm. um, so to repeat again, so learn as random example access, but now the Boolean function f is arbitrary. There is no you don't know anything, it's just an unstructured Boolean function. Any given query or if the query access to that number. And the task is to output the hypothesis whose error is at most opt plus epsilon, where opt is the best that you can achieve to any function in C. Uh, so, I, of course, ideally, you'd want to output the best hyperplane in your class. Which can approximate the function f, but in this case, allow you some relaxation, just output something and just close it. So, this is a task for most of um, So, I want to mention one or two caveats right now. If, if the model is here again, so one or two caveats here that agnostic learning is an extremely general model of learning. In particular, I focused uh, the examples to be on the uniform distribution, and the labels come from Boolean function F. But typically, agnostic learner just deals with arbitrary joint distribution over examples and labels, and yet you're supposed to get something as close as possible. And another thing is, even in the fact learning setting, I only spoke about learning over uniform distribution, but uh, traditionally, it was defined to be over the case that. So, when you're getting samples from your underlying data set, you don't know what distribution you're getting it over. So, you want to be able to output a hypothesis which works well over every unknown distribution. So, this is called distribution data. Uh, I'll get to that if uh, necessary a bit later, but for now, we can just focus on learning what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, so another to make this more concrete. Uh, so what I spoke about earlier as far as realizable learning, and in that case, for realizable learning, where uh, f just belongs to c, then opt c f is just here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, now let's go back to the task. Okay. Uh, so, yes, as a uh, client, so I'm given random example access to any Boolean function f. And so, gets query access. And I want to delegate this task to this one. And I want to check if the server's answer the fact. But now the previous trick won't work anymore. Why? Because this function is hard to compute. Knowing optimal error with respect to any function in this class. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't see how this can be computed easily. So now this problem becomes non-trivial, at least for such answer. For such easy protocol or algorithm. So now we can actually ask the server to convince me that the results have been computed accurately. And how do I do this? I engage in some for the interactive group where now I'm going to seamlessly switch from calling to the client to a very fire view and the server will henceforth we call as a proof. So the verifier and prover engage in a series of conversations. By the end of which the verifier is convinced that the prover is correct or not. But at the same time, if there's a malicious prover 
is trying to convince the very first of a bad result, then it should be able to catch it. So how do you set this up? I'll just go a bit to detail about the practical questions. For which I think I'll be erasing this much. So yeah. So, uh, this has been uh, the broadest group system where you have a verifier and a prover, where the prover could be potentially unbounded in its computation power. And you have a given language. So let's, let's just let, let go of learning for now. Let's just think of inductive proof as separate thing for a couple of minutes. So the verifier gets an input x. The proof also knows everything. Uh, and wants to check if x belongs to L or not. So what happens then is that the verifier and the prover exchange. A series of methods. By the end of which the verifier is convinced that means it's in a So this is an interactive thing. And this is one of the most fundamental probabilistic proof systems in computation complexity. Uh, which have found significant use since their uh, discovery for yeah, the last few decades, both in theory and practice. But as any proof system, you want to define what happens uh, when X is in the language of uh, when you know, when you're given a proof statement. So the requirements of this proof system would be for you have completeness. Where if X belongs to L, then there exists an honest prover. P stars, F stars, probability. So the verifiers are randomized by that. It can toss its own coin and make decisions. Probability or its internal randomness and the messages which will also be randomized. Um, so interaction between B and B to the one to the fixed distance. By this, I mean to say it's entire interaction and the output. That's the limitation for that. But it's not just the but also interaction itself. So we have some this. So what completeness means is that you have a true statement, there exists a proof of this fact. But in this model, it means to say that there exists this helpful prover with whom I can talk to. And they're they're trying to convince me that they they, they manage to convince me that X belongs to that. Other hand, we also want to say that if I'm given a false statement, I should not be able to prove it in this model. So how do I prove this thing? X is not in L. And for every prover, P, who could be malicious and unfounded, I pick your favorite objectives here, and then you say the probability of P. Zero that he sleeps. So the input is not in the language, then no prover. Even if they are malicious, they're trying to cheat, or and even if they have gone in power, can manage to convince the verifier. So there should be BP or X.
convenience is a very common process. This is a broad set of interactive groups. But now one can think of this as um, like an interactive way of verifying statements. So if you all have seen the language NP, which is that you've just given a proof and you want to check if it is correct in polynomial times. So interactive proof is sometimes a generalization of that where your verifier also has rankings. At the same time, you can actually talk to the prover. So this goes back to what can we verify using these systems. Uh, uh, in fact, there was this very famous result proof for interactive groups, which said that if a language has such an interactive group where the verifier has been born on the time, and the number of messages is also born on the end, then class ID of languages inside such proof systems is equal to this. How is this is like a humongous class? Like NB is like a very small. Subset somewhere inside. Well, can you the subject? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so just by thinking of verification itself, we can already capture so many more problems. So, in a sense, this tries to capture the notion of verification versus computation itself, but in an interactive sense. Now, going back to this. So now going back to the setting of lab, can I interact with the proof and then ask it to convince me that it has learned agnostically the given class C up to the up to a small f. So we call this as back verification. And this was this model was uh, initiated by Goldwasser. What's the name? Sorry. Yeah, here we go. Or painting. Where now we want to do that. At the end of the day, the verifier still wants to learn and output hypothesis H. And again, yeah, going from this setting, so we have requirements of completeness. Where there exists an honest over two. That's uh, at the end of the interaction, V and P star output hypothesis H, so very bad output hypothesis H. That's that the probability over its randomness and interaction H. Uh, The D of the H and the F is just the probability for the uniform distribution H and F. <laughs> And then silence. So for every number, so okay, for completeness, there exists this <coughs> one learner or approver who can convince me that the results of their learning task is correct and make me output a hypothesis which is good. Whereas for soundness, you want to say that no prover out there will convince me to accept a bad hypothesis. Right? So I want to say for every prover, that at the end of the day, V or P star 
what is H? Um, so I'm saying like the upward means up to the I'll tell you the upward. Yeah, I'm out. Well, I'm repeating that. So the one is so, uh, again, for completeness here, there exists this learner, or prover will convince the verifier the output a good hypothesis with high probability. On the other hand, no prover can make the verifier accept a bad hypothesis with uh, high probability. In other words, I want to say no prover will convince the verifier to output a bad hypothesis. And not reason. So this symbol is what I'm using to say if it objects the proof is cheating, sometimes you just say no, nah, just you lying. I won't trust. So the fact that either it outputs reject or it outputs a good hypothesis, you can go. It's for sounds. And now so far, uh, is this clear? By the way, this is uh, the the model. Uh, in a more common sense, and if there's any questions, uh, we'll try to make it better. Oh, and uh, in probes, uh, it is also a model when you have two provers, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, it is more, more uh, powerful model. Yeah, it is uh, MIP, and it is uh -huh. next. Uh -huh. But uh, is, is there some analogies there in, in uh, learning or not? I don't know. It's a good question. There's a very new line of work. <laughs> there's a uh, yeah, like you can count the papers in one hand so far. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. So, I don't know. Maybe there's a lot more possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so far I've only spoken in some sense about qualitative difference between the verifier and the prover. A and B, I haven't really spoken about what efficiency here particularly means. Right. So an important criteria here is that the prover mm -hmm. is efficient. Also, you haven't told us no. that agnostic learning is possible. I assume it is, otherwise you wouldn't be concerned with it. Yes, there are very few results known, but they are yeah. Like for example, uh Find the hyperplane closest to that. Right? Yeah, there are there are some hardness results and non hardness results known for hyperplanes. But for AC zero quality, for example, there's an agnostic learner here. Uh, but it uses membership queries. Uh, and uh, I guess if you can learn the heavy Fourier coefficient and function, you can use it to approximate that line function, near the length function. Right? But I'll be coming to these soon enough. So yeah, there's some caveats which I have ignored so far. So we see, of course, it's the next. proof is in bounded. Yeah, you can definitely know the best age possible. Yes, but can you still convince? Can you still convince? Yes. Yeah. Um, I also talked about that. <laughs> yeah. So. So one other question. So yeah. in the completeness and soundness yeah. in usual uh -huh. interactive proofs, uh -huh. you say X is in L uh -huh. and X is not in L. Yeah. It's yeah. a search problem, right? There yeah. is no, what is the truth uh, that you want to convince yourself of that the hypothesis is good. So one can also think of it this way, that the proof is in the hypothesis. 
And then that is check if the hypothesis is that good or not. But at the end of the day, the verifier still wants to perform a learning task. So that's why you want to output a good hypothesis. Mm -hmm. In this case, it'll just output whatever the code send it. Right. So there, there's always a correct answer. Yeah, there is always a correct answer. It could be very bad. Like the the, the off itself could be really bad. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. And uh, like the difference is here in the sumness, if x is not in L, you should just never get convinced. Yeah. But here, no matter what the function f is, uh -huh. there is something that is correct, and you should get convinced by. It, yeah. Which is yeah. Yeah. But I didn't catch that. Yeah, like I mean, the uh, because two was kind of bad hypothesis. That's the not the able to. Okay, so, uh, yeah, back to a real world uh, expression of this uh, combination is that uh, what? Even if you give it a learning task, it's a server out there. It is still a bounded machine. So to be again, in this case, we expect the honest tool to be efficient. So unlike the usual setting where the honest tool can be unbounded, we want this honest tool as a requirement to be efficient. The unbound tool is trying to be malicious. So the malicious tool could still be unbounded. Exactly. Whereas the honest tool is required to be efficient. So we call it the doubly efficient group systems. And why these have been uh, like this is model for learning is quite new. So this delegation of computing itself has been studied for quite some time now. Uh, in this previous mm -hmm. Obligation using embedded groups. This has been uh, quite an active area of research, both theory and practice. Uh, so, one of the uh, examinal work in the stream was by Goldwasser, Talai, and Barcelona. I think uh, the journal version came out in 15, somewhat, but like the conference version came much, much earlier. So they show that for every language in NC, there exists an interactive group, which are being uh, yeah, interactive group for the L, where the verifier B runs in uh, n times polylog in time. We're back. So now the connection is off. So now we're back. Okay. So yeah. So in the setting, you want to delegate the stars of computation within NC to a prover. Now the prover gets the uh, and at the same time, the verifier gets convinced about the results of the computation in your linear time. That's the prover doesn't follow the time. So the key thing here, again, in the learning or the setting, is that you want to have a proof system where the prover is efficient, but the verifier is highly efficient. So in other words, you don't want the verifier to run this polytime algorithm on its own. It beats the purpose in some sense. So you want 
Mm -hmm. Honest tour to be efficient, the malicious tour can still be unlawful, but the verifier is highly efficient. So you want to be able to verify the result of the task much quicker than actually performing it from scratch. Right. And have another works like RPW, so Rothblum, Badhan, Mitterson, where they show again for L, then C, you have an interactive group. Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, 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 sorry. V, v runs in order and, and polylog in time. Ah, sorry. And okay, yeah. Whereas V star runs in polylog time. V star runs. So is this more visible now? So, so the difference yes. is uh, that uh, this is not for a man or it is M for a log that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and, it's uh, nearly new. Now suppose V uh, had the circuit itself. Uh, I mean, there is some caveat here, it's any uniform. Uh, uniform in different, in some sense it's uniform. So for uniform algorithm, so, to check if this input is in the language, we would need polynomial time on its own. To run them. Yeah, but in this case, since it's near linear time, it can't even run the search. So it has to ask the prover to do this to help it out. So, yeah, in a similar way, uh, so you have this was done by Roxanne Bazan and Dirksen, and there have been one follow ups to this since, where there exists an interactive group of proximity with, uh, where you want to decide between x is an L or x is for some epsilon far from every string. String in L. And they show that you can a verifier in the setting, the verifier cannot read the entire input, and it can only look at a few points in the input. There's a sublinear system of uh, computation. So you can get uh, interactive boost proximity where you have square root and queries and communication as well. The verifier is this, and we just run in one time. P gets the end And again, the theme of doubly efficient proof system is quite frequent in the delegation of computation setting as a whole. So, yeah. So now, what do I mean by an efficient improvement in that question? Here? Does it mean efficient in terms of Query access or efficient in terms of time. Uh, well, I would say time is, uh, yeah, I think they're both relevant. And depending on the task at hand, we can try to minimize them both. But another caveat here is that I only mentioned the difference between random examples and emission queries. So this is like a qualitative separation. You can also think of quantitative separations where the verifier also gets query access. But then you want this to learn using much fewer queries than the So there's two settings. There's like two separate settings. So there's a model of fact verification, delegation, computation. So I'll just uh, pause for a bit. Because after this, I move on to the results in this model. So if there's any questions, anything which you want to know. So, and so that we can actually do much better in 
uh, if you have uh, if you have an interaction. We are just worried about verification, actually computing the rather than performing the learning. So firstly we show the consider computing B Fourier coefficients. So in this case, uh, so how familiar is everyone here with Fourier analysis of the Boolean function? No. We don't need, I'll just try to take a list. Uh, we don't need anything. So we have Boolean function f. So I'm going to minus sum as a representation. Uh, and what we know is that for every Boolean function has uh, an equivalent Boolean representation. Uh, this is a function from G by one to the N for years. What's that? The of the X. And then for a real U. Zero one to the end. Two times I is x is minus one times the inner product of u. So these are called. So every function has a unique Boolean uh, representation, uh, or where each you know parity or character as uh, or rather more normal in this case, uh, over to the values. And like a commonly used fact in this world is Parsifal's theorem. It says that for any Boolean function f, the sum zero one to the n. Some of you, the square sum of the square is which is equal to one. So, I think it's very carefully for this. And one more thing is uh, coefficient. So, I call this set. Of plus that tau as the set of coefficients, characters, that set of So I'm going to follow the tau heavy coefficients of characters. Well, this would be characters, but the values would be coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, so, why do we care about this? Uh, so, I think George, who is watching this by Zoom, then I should tell him that this is over the group Z2 to the N. Are you with us, George? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just think of the set zero one as the set z two, and you take the group z two to the n and the addition. Mm -hmm. okay. See, see, it's a commutative group. Okay. So the theory, so the Fourier analysis is uh, so it's commutative. So it's uh, every irreducible is one dimensional. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the character is actually the only. Uh, it's an homomorphism. Right. So special case. 
So, so the characters span the, the class. So the characters span the class of functions from the group to R. Right. So they, they form a, a orthonormal basis of these functions. Yeah. You know, if we write any function from the group to R, uh, you know, you can always expand it as a, as a sum, you express it in this basis of characters. Yeah. Yeah, I still remember that. And that's it. And so how many characters will there be? Well, two to the end, because the group is commutative. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the characters are this. Okay. There are, uh, so you take, uh, take, so you index them by a subset of N, and the character corresponding to you is minus one to the inner product mod two of Q and X. Yeah. That's that becomes the character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty, pretty neat. So then Parseval's theorem is just saying that uh, I guess uh, the inner product that you choose is one where every Boolean function that has square norm one, has norm one. Mm -hmm. So the inner product is somehow normalized by one of the two. Mm, okay. And so, and now the first of all, theorem is just saying under a change of basis, the, the norm doesn't change. So, hmm. okay. But maybe Atika has actually not studied this yet. So, so you're going to be able to do this well. So, I mean, uh, is there any thing you want to know about this? Sorry. Well, you know, it's like first time. I remember the first time someone hit me with this <laughs> some talk. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, is there anything else you want to know? Yeah. Uh, compare like, it was first time you think of it. Yeah. But for now, okay. All we need to know is that every Boolean function has such a representation as like a as a multilinear polynomial over here. And the coefficients behave nice, like it's, uh, some, it's equal to one. As, but as I said, you can take inner products over normalizing the product. And then the definition, we just I define a set of uh, tau, larger than tau, as a set of uh, characters which have la a heavy Fourier coefficient. Yeah, and maybe, maybe this helps. So, can you see that the space of functions over zero, one of that take n bits and output real numbers? This, you can, this is a vector space. Right, what's the dimension of this vector space? It's two to the n, right? Because each function has two to the n different values, right? Okay, so so each function is just a large big vector, right? It has two to the n different values, namely at position x, you put f of x, right? It's a big vector. And now we're writing this vector in a particular basis, and it has some nice group theoretic properties, but maybe that doesn't matter, it's just a different basis, right? So, so this linear space, well. Here's one basis for this space. Say the function which is one on a particular x and zero everywhere else. That's the basis for the space, right? Meaning in this linear space, any function can be represented in this space, right? But this is a different basis, right? So it's some rotation, you do some rotation on this space and you get a different basis. But because this other basis is also normal, is an also normal basis, you can express any function as some linear combination of these other vectors. And that's what the Fourier transform is doing. Now. Right? So, so, and this F hat is nothing but the inner product of this F as a vector with this chi u as a vector. Right? And then that's just the usual, and then that's just the usual, uh, that's just the usual way. If you have an orthonormal basis, right? If you have an orthonormal basis, how do you express a vector in this basis? Well, it's the sum of the inner product of the vector with the basis vector times the basis vector. Right? And that's so you can do by the inner product. That and that's actually the inner product that is being used. You take the mean, you take the average over x uniformly distributed of f of x times some other g of x. That's your inner product. And under this inner product, every Boolean function will have. Do you see the definition? Mm -hmm. 
right? So now just some sanity checks. So under this inner project, any Boolean function, meaning that for every input X, it's either plus one or minus one. It'll have norm one. Why? Well, let's see. So what's the squared norm? It's just the inner product of F with itself, right? But if, it, if the function is always, always plus or minus one value, we take the inner product of F with itself. Every term is just one, because it's either plus one times one or minus one, right? And now you sum, so in total we have two to the n, but now we're taking the average, so we divide by two to the n. So the squared norm is one. So under this inner product, any Boolean function plus or minus one value has Euclidean norm exactly one. And I should change the basis. The norm doesn't change. And we haven't proven that these high yields are not for normal basis, but they are. And then Parcival's theorem comes. Right? Because you've just changed the basis and I've expressed the function in a different basis, the norm doesn't change. But what's the squared norm of, of the function f written in this basis? It's just the sum of the squared square equation that still has to be one. And that's the proof of Parcival's theorem. And of course, there's a lot more to say about it, but it will give you at least some flavor of what's happening. And now what you're trying to say is, so what are what's the tau heavy Fourier coefficients, right? You've expressed f in this new basis, and now you want to understand which basis elements matter, where the coordinate written in this basis is big, and where which don't matter. Thanks. Um, yeah. So why is my seed from nowhere? Um, so there's a lot of relevance in learning theory itself because if you can express this result by Fisher Levitz Swanko, which builds on another result, famous result by Gold Rice 11, where uh, if you can estimate all the tau heavy coefficients of a Boolean function, then in some sense you can learn the Boolean function. So now the question becomes uh, how easy is it to do this? And um, we like this. Can I erase this model? Is this clear by the the back verification model itself? Yeah, so Fourier analysis of like the Boolean functions are ubiquitously used in multiple areas in complex theory, uh, including learning theory as well. And can compute all the tau And what does tau need to be for it to epsilon learn the function or something? Does that make sense? That question. Sorry? What does tau need, what does tau need to be for you to epsilon learn the function? Oh, uh, it depends on. Uh, okay, it's not like for any class. Like it depends. So you can use the black box mm -hmm. for certain classes. Say I want to learn decision S, uh, sorry, size S decision trees. For that, you can use uh, computing uh, 1 over 2s, heavy coefficients, and that oh. enough to learn the decision. decision. Any decision tree. So when I say I can learn any Boolean function class, it's like, yeah. So, yeah, I was uh, not being completely correct. Like, yeah, certain Boolean function classes, which uh, can be approximated well by parities. You can learn them using 
this is what I can define. And this perspective was by Christian Smart. But the crucial point here is that you require membership variance to the function. And in particular, calling n one tau many variance. Right? So, yeah, now the question is can I have an interactive version for this? So, very fine. The tau heavy coefficient, so Boolean function. And so we show first that. The verifier has a random example of access to some arbitrary union function. The viewer has very access to it. And then that the outputs something to the final doubt. And important thing is use reference. Volume one more down samples. Whereas the Google this is poly and over time. And they both run in poly and over time. So, yeah, without a prover, uh, any, I mean, the known algorithms, they use poly and out of queries to learn all the top heavy coefficients, but given a prover, you can verify this using this poly one of the many samples. Now this this presents like a significant improvement, both qualitative and quantitative. In the sense, Prova still uses poly one of the queries, but this is input independent. The number of samples. Suppose you just want to know, say, the one over thousand heavy coefficients of Boolean function. Why do you need poly n queries for this? You can verify this using constantly. Yeah. And but the running time on both sides is possible. And for context, so the first paper on that verification showed something like this, but they the verify use again body in all thousand. So this also presents like a significant improvement over the interactive world right solutions. So this is the first thing. What is this paper that you just said? Poly and Overtow sample? Uh, Goldwasser, what, no, did what did it show? Oh, the same thing, but with no. Poly and Overtow sample, verified with Poly. Oh, that uses queries, not the random one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it uses queries, uh, Poly and Overtow sample versus Prover having Poly and Overtow queries. Okay. I see, I see. So here we get rid of this thing. So this is uh, like from the unbounded separation, a large. So it's a first one. Uh, next. So yeah, and here I'll erase this and come back to this uh, later. Next, we go on to computation models where we want to agnostically learn. Shadow gap circuits, or in this case, AC0 parity. So, what is AC0 parity? It's a class of functions computable by constant gap circuits, which have R and and XR or like mod two gates.
and uh, the index and the number of fields is called the n. Right. So, it is a in the class of functions computable by uh, circuits which have constant depth, following in size, and have and, or, and plus gates, and also negation gates floating around. Uh, but the pattern of any of these gates are unbounded. Right? This class is used by it. Yes, we have a class. Sorry, it's class. I just excel. I but it's ah seven without application gates. Sorry, without application gates. Without application gates. Uh, is there it has a, negation gates? I just haven't drawn it. But what is the? Huh? Sorry, maybe a very stupid question. But we, we can uh, sort uh, without instead of sort uh, use uh, so, uh, or or uh, integration and uh, express sort of uh, is well, it's unbound. The pen and pen is unbound. By any gate, the panel can be yeah. super large. Yeah. And yeah, right. I mean, has negation gates could have. So, so yeah, but number of gates is poly n, unbounded panel, depth is constant, and the number of gates is poly n. So A is zero parity. Uh, so important to note here is that this prevents the frontier of what we can learn. Uh, so this algorithm by Carmozino, Pagliazzo, Cavanitz, and Paul uh, 16 CI 17. Where in this one, we show that AC is zero parity. And we Agnostically run the word the uniform distribution in two to the body login. As well as trades. Wait, what do you mean AC0 can be agnostic to that? The hypothesis comes from AC0 apparently? Oh no, the target, again, like we want to approximate uh, as best as possible to the to AC0 party. The hypothesis here actually comes from NC, uh, much even larger than NC. Yeah. Okay. Is it at all possible, like, suppose I don't somehow, <laughs> it seems like maybe if the hypothesis is very simple. Mm -hmm. Are there like obstacles that I could learn any function? Hypothesis is very simple. Let's say it's a hybrid map. It's a, it's a uh -huh. linear thread mm -hmm. These are my hypotheses. And I just want to get a good hybrid plane. And I can sample, maybe take samples from my friend. Because I feel that that's what like neural networks, yeah, that's what I, they do, right? There are some hardness results about this, but I'm not completely sure what the exact reality is. But there are some hardness in those things. This is just one threshold view. Right, one threshold. Yeah. yeah. But the function might not be a threshold gate. Okay. Yeah, the function is kind of, yeah. You just kind of hope that it is, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you, you pass it through your yeah. your algorithm uh -huh. and it spits out some threshold gate. Okay. Uh -huh. Then you hope that, you know, that it'll work. Yeah. I think that's what they're doing roughly. I mean, there's this the sense now, but which is not much. But they have changed a few things. So yeah, they have uh, networks of these things, I suppose, and then somehow I see. And there's there's some gradient descent, I guess. So I think that's the model. I mean, in your horizon somewhere, that this should be it, right? I want to learn. Mm -hmm. I have some data. I upload the data on the server. I press play. The server spits out some network. Mm -hmm. I make sure I'm getting my money's worth. Yeah. That did a good job. Yeah. It didn't 
didn't skip some computations that I want him not to skip. And... Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's the horizon. Of course, right? That is the horizon. And yeah, I mean, yeah, one, if, one, if one believes that threshold circuits and neural networks are uh, similar, some people say the same, but I don't know. Uh, right. Yeah. Then, yeah, this is uh, the point here. But at the same time, uh, yeah, we don't even have learning algorithms for this. Don't even have, uh, they don't believe to have uh, done one thing. Basically, the work is assuming pseudo random functions. So, I don't know. Yeah. At least we don't know. To start with, we don't know also. Because this is, yeah, we can't do But you could you could hope that you just want to prove that they did their gradient descent the way they're supposed to. Right? It's not. So what is the prover doing here? Then is it trying to learn, or is it just trying to do some form of gradient descent? Yeah, he's trying to actually apply an algorithm, a particular algorithm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And you wanna you wanna be convinced that this algorithm is fine. This is what's happening. Yeah. So there is a related work on this where you just want to verify. Given algorithm, whatever it is going. Here I'm only talking about membership theories of dynamic examples, but the gradient descent is it's more unclear what it is. So there is, yeah, there's a follow up of GRSY by Schaefer and Dupreja, uh, I think, yeah, Dupreja and Schaefer, where they uh, consider like verifying a given algorithm. You just want to do as best as what the given algorithm does. Yeah, and they show. For certain the kind of models you can yeah. yeah, here we're just talking about like the best possible scenario, which might not be right, right. But they talk about particular algorithm, which could be using any query, whatever they're doing something. Yeah. Uh -huh. And somehow, yeah, it's a gradient descent, and somehow giving you some hypothesis. And you still want to check it using random mm -hmm. This is what yeah, one of the hypothesis. Yeah. So, yeah, going back. So, this is the frontier of what we can learn and can be agnostically learned. By which I mean to say, uh, like I fix the ground tool that has zero parity circuits. And I want to output a hypothesis which is as close as possible to the best case of zero parity circuit. And yeah, CIKK 17, they show that you can agnostically learn a zero parity over uniform distribution in quasi polynomial time and pairings. But the caveat that the hypothesis has error polylogging times not. Uh, the error is one to two. So, yeah, now we start. So, this is also a mission query. So, theorem two. Wait, but again, I asked now, is it off zero? Because you're trying to learn an AC02 circuit? No, it's agnostically learning, so where the ground, it's, a, it's, it's an arbitrary Boolean. Ah, AC02 is the, is the hypothesis. Yeah. But in that case, it's an improper learning, uh, which I didn't talk about so far. Uh, the fact that, I mean, your learner could, it, it wants to output the best AC0 parity server, but mm -hmm. it could just be incapable of doing so. In efficient time. Mm -hmm. So I put some, which does the same, achieve the same guarantee, but need not remain zero part. Right, right. So the hypothesis doesn't have to come from the time class. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, and you're saying that this can actually be done. Oh, but that's already quite impressive. I mean, this is some kind of neural net. This is a yeah. Well, maybe not. <laughs> 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 it can't compute. Threshold, <laughs> 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 right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, well, the mod gate is like the threshold gate, a little bit. I mean, it's a mod growth, of course, not mod two, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways. So we'll say that this is a reality. Can the back be fine again? Where now we have 
So I'm going to use quasi poly as q poly of any samples. This is q poly of n pairs, and the books run in q poly. So again, for contents, so AC zero parity, uh, learning using random examples, is has been open for a really long time. Uh, we don't know anything better than brute force for learning AC zero parity, even in the realizable case. But the ground truth is that your given function comes from this class, even in that case, we don't know anything better than brute force. Uh, and with respect to agnostic learning itself, it is even believed to be hard to be done in for a long time. As you mean, cryptography conjectures like learning parities uh, with noise is hard. So, but then suddenly with the proof, you can learn it using possible polynomial in examples. Where uh, proof makes possible polynomial in examples. So, yeah. Again, what if I only wanted it for AC0? It's either already has a learning algorithm using proxy polynomial in random examples. So the right question there to ask would be can we do it better than that? No, but maybe I want the server to do those other polynomials, whatever as many sample yeah. queries or whatever. Samples. That's it. Samples. Really and that's, that's kind of more realistic, no? Because you want to learn, you want to you want to put your AI and you have some samples of your data, right? So so you can learn it with several samples. You have several samples in your hand. But I don't want to spend part of the sample. Mm -hmm. I just want to poly and samples. Right. I just want to do, yeah, a few, maybe even any organic sample. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Ah. It's a valid question. Yeah, I know. But somehow, you know, if you think of AC0 as your neural network, which is a big thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a starting point of neural network. <laughs> yeah, you can do approximate counting, right? Yeah. So you could put some approximate threshold case in there. Uh -huh. And now, okay, maybe the threshold isn't exact, but it's yeah. a network. It's now it's a neural network. Right? So I put approximate thresholds there. Yeah. Now that's really more or less the task here, up to this approximate, which is a little bit of an issue. But right now that's really the task, right? So we both have the database, but I don't want to do the computation. I give it to the server. It tries to find the best AC0 circuit, meaning this you neural know, network with approximate thresholds mm -hmm. to solve it. But it might need to read the entire database, which is like quasi polynomial in many queries. Yeah. Whatever that means. No, yeah, samples in the case, but yes. Sample, sorry, samples, not queries, samples, exactly samples. And then I want to do, but now, you know, but I don't want to read the entire database. I want to be not using any compute and now. Are you done? Okay, tell me, prove me that you're done. And he said, okay, you're done. So now he gives me some neural network, which is some AC0 circuit, and I'll have to be satisfied. Yeah, uh, and using very few samples. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, uh, it seems hard. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, so is this here? The user work and uh, the context of uh, yeah. uh, best known random examples without the photo. Even in the realizable setting, it's just two books. So if you're in Google, you can suddenly push this down to possible. And again, the hypothesis here is for the login time to stop. Well, essentially, the verifier is running the CIT algorithm and using the prover to answer its queries. So it inherits uh, the characteristics and so on. Correct. So moving on to the next result, uh, can I raise that? Is it here? So we also show uh, like factorification for another fundamental class of functions called k functors, where every Boolean function uh, depends on k unknown variables. And we show a similar input independent separation there, where you can verify this using poly k, poly two to the k, 
uh, samples. Whereas quality uh, duplicate times ten over k, no, so quality duplicate samples. Whereas you need quality duplicate times log n pairs. But I won't go into detail. So uh, this goes back to the question which you asked earlier. What if the honest tool unbound? So typically in interactive groups, honest tool is allowed to be unbound. So what happens in this case? So we then again the model becomes not even that. Even it is phase negative. Like it says uh, it becomes easy. You can even learn people for long time and using constant in samples. And so yeah, in some sense, it's, it's trying to say that this requirement of W efficient for this is a necessity for the, for for proving more interesting results. But if you allow for the honest store to be unbounded here, then even P poly will start working very efficiently. Again for context, P poly is believed to be hard to learn and fall on with time. And also in this case, in the distribution of this case. Can work or, or unknown distribution. So for context, P poly is hard believed to be hard to learn in polygon in time, even over the uniform distribution and in the realized density, assuming one way functions. So yeah, let's uh, come on. And this and this is show uh, assuming one functions is a bit. Yeah, assuming one way functions, the poly is hard to learn efficiently, even with the uniform distribution and realizable. Like, so, this is a agnostic distribution tree. This is constantly many samples for transportation. Ah, wow. That's interesting. Is there a bound on the communication? Oh, for the end. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, double addition two systems are necessary in this model of that. So, yeah, so these are the results. And stop here for a few minutes. So, I can take a break. And then I try to present the proof of the learning very good information. And yeah, of course, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Or if you're already done with this, do <laughs> no, uh, anything which is in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, so, uh, not sure if I'll be able to get to this later, but just a very quick note about how we do this that we can uh, think of uh, agnostic learning itself as a decision task. So, you're given a bunch of samples. And you're given a hypothesis, and you want to say, is this hypothesis the best one? And this you can do uh, in exponential time, but in parallel using an NC circuit. 
you check for each hypothesis if it is close by, and then pick the best one, and then check if it is indeed you know, the given hypothesis close. So if you can do that, then you can use GKR, which is a delegation protocol for decision problems, and then that can be a very fast verification protocol. Of course, there are some more tricks which we need to do to get like, much fewer samples. That still requires poly and samples. Yeah, thank you. But for that, we take a permutation. We take a bunch of samples and take a bunch of other random queries and permute them using a random permutation. And then ask the prover to answer it now. Because the prover has no idea what the permutation is. Uh, we can catch it if it is lying in multiple cases. Maybe with some probability. But we have some labeled samples and we have some unlabeled samples. Now the prover is, uh, and we permute them and send it to the prover. The prover has no idea which ones are labeled and unlabeled. So with some probability, we can check. So we can push it down to the number. Great. And this one, uh, let's see, we have some time and talk about this briefly to us. But like the short answer here is that CIDK uses the Nissan Vegas and Reconstruction Protocol. And we show the queries which Nissan Vegas and Reconstruction algorithm makes. It has some structure which allows the queries delegated to the prover by hiding the appropriate key. I'll get to this. It seems so. Uh, but just to clarify that, so when you said that thing about permitting randomly, mm -hmm. does that mean that just with Constantly many samples, I can make uh, poly and samples via the prover. Yeah, yeah. poly and unlabeled samples, and constantly many labeled samples. Mm -hmm. And I have them. Yeah. And yeah, the probability that the prover gets away cheating is very good. It doesn't it have to answer. Yeah. Correct. It doesn't know which of these are uh, labeled. Yes. But I can't make queries because the prover can know which queries I'm going to make. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Yes. And in fact, uh, one of the main frameworks for theorem one and theorem two, which I hope to explain shortly, is that for in this fact verification setting, we have this general framework for query to sample reduction, where if you have a verifier which uses queries mm -hmm. and learns uh, having a prover, then you can replace it with samples. Where you can delegate the query computation to the prover and if you do this in a smart way, then you can actually ensure the prover can apply. Yeah. So yeah, that's one of the takeaways which I mentioned, which is general framework for sample, very sample reduction. All right, so so we can. Um, also, <laughs> what are you spicing? So it would be instructed to go over the go like seven algorithm quickly. Uh like just the main idea so to understand how we can backward apply faithfully equations, right? So, what we're going to do is that we consider computation of faithfully equations as a tree, where each node represents a 
sum of the squared sum of the vectors in the collection represented by the loop. So next. The algorithm does is that so this is this is for all you such that u1 equals zero. The first point is zero. All of the prefix of all uh, the, the squared sum of all the equations for vectors is the zero prefix. And similarly, this would be u and u1 equals one. So at this stage, it checks if any of them has weight less than say tau square over four. Tau square over two. Yeah. And if so, then it just stops. I haven't mentioned how the how it checks, but I'll come to that. So assume for now that we can check. We can estimate this value. Like assume that there's a quick algorithm which can estimate this value for each one. And it checks if this estimate is less than so you want to learn tau with the coefficients, if this is less than say tau square over two. And it just stops computation there. And it keeps on doing this at least step. And if not, this continues. Now you have uh, a node. The u1, u2 equals 0, 0. The u1, u2 equals 0, 1. The u1, u2 equals 1, 1. And you keep on doing this. Of the depth n, where the n. You just have yeah, you, you have the full equations because all n prefix, all n bits are set. So you have specific you let me call them as B B B right, which are just full equations and what key? Oh, because you might not have everything on the weight. Yeah. Uh, the point here is that by parcel scale, since you're only trying to compute tau and equal equations, uh, the number of such sleeves can be at most one more tau squared. Okay. <laughs> Which means that at each level, the number of nodes is one over tau squared. Which means that there's also at most one more tau squared. And the depth is n again. You go to all the layers. At the end, you have nodes which have a single element. So if you can estimate the value, you know that these are the hidden coefficients. But now the question arises: how do you estimate these values? Mm -hmm. So I won't go into calculations, maybe, but what you can do here is so set of all. U and zero one to one. Where U one U R equals S the string S. Then you can compute that that U equals squared. This is given by expectation equals right. You can do something from the other side.
So this estimate can be computed by the following formula. Where you take uniformly random string over the minus i bits, and then if you take another uniform two uniform random strings on i bits, you compute f y z and the parity which is with respect to the right box. Would you like to go into the detail of these calculations? Okay, yes. So I mean I've never seen this. Okay. I realize now because like that. Um, this this theorem. So I'd actually like to might as well okay so learn something new. But give me just a second. So yeah. that's saying that to estimate the Fourier coefficients, the sum of all the Fourier coefficients that have some fixed prefix S, let's mm -hmm. say I only need to compute some kind of correlations with chi s. Yeah. I'm guessing because the rest will somehow cancel. Okay. Yeah, so uh, okay. Before going into calculations, I just want to say if you if you have a formula, you can estimate this quite easily using membership tables. Why? Just pick a uniformly random example. YZ yeah. and get this value and then pick another uniform random string Y prime and make membership query on this to get this value. And then you take a bunch of these, say one over epsilon squared many of these, and you get this value of the original energy. So you can estimate this value using one over epsilon. Yeah, epsilon is some function of tau, so poly one over tau many membership queries, and there's n of these, so poly n over tau many membership queries, you end up learning on the heat of the equations. And each step there's at most one over tau squared many nodes. And now if we have a way of exchanging membership queries by random queries with a verifier, with a prover, if you have a prover, mm -hmm. Now you'd be done, except he promises that there wouldn't be an end. Yes, I just find out what GRS will do. If they, yeah. they do something, uh, they hide these queries in like a random space, uh, and it's, uh, it's going to that matter. But yeah, so um, all right, let me try to recap this. So, we have above x. It is so much about that. So, fix any i as the first i in its prefix. Aren't those the same terms? Sorry? What's that? Oh, aren't those the same, the same terms that you're multiplying in the expectation? Why? This is a different paradigm. Right, but you have an expectation. Yeah. So you're, you're taking expectation over Y prime, right? Yeah, yeah. It's square. Then you're not, uh, then it's just you're changing Y with Y prime. It's the same term, though. Same number squared, yes. Yeah. These two expectations, these two inner expectations are oh. exactly the same number. Yeah, because it comes from, essentially, it's this square. Yeah, it is that. Okay. It, so. it uh, is that squared, but to compute it, we can split it in this. I see. Yeah, yeah. It is that squared. And we can, yeah, hopefully we'll see it now. So Z and minus I, Y, X, you can think of it as Y, Z.
So, okay, using this Kuri expansion, I'm just splitting this progressive frequency. Nothing but rewriting these things. Right. Now, I can think of this as. Uh, to be consistent, I'll just use the while. U and So that should be a part of ST. Yes. Again, we are the same thing. But now I can think of this as a function where for each s, uh, this would be function over set g s over minus one, one to the of oh, zero, one to the minus i to the GS is given by its function. GS is So, in other words, if I have a prefix fixed. On the first items, and I want to compute the Fourier function under this restriction, then the function is given by the formula. Right? Now, if I use Parseval's theorem, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Is it clear that the range of the function is minus one? Then? It should be R. Yeah. It should be R. Yeah. That's the full equation of F restricted to uh, some Y, I guess. Yes. Am I correct? No, the prefix of your input. If it is a S, so assume that for any input, the first I of which are set to S, and the resulting function would be GS of the set, where the, the, it's on the n minus I variables. So Another way of also looking at this is that it is the Fourier coefficient of to consider uh, i, and if I have restricted the n minus i variables to z, yeah. then this yeah. is the Fourier yeah. coefficient of s. Yeah. But one can also look at this. So here you're restricting z to get this. Okay. But in this case, you're restricting s. But then you get a Boolean function. This is a Boolean function over Z. Mm -hmm. Or a real value function. Z. Mm -hmm. oh. 
form I see. Okay. Let's say six and this is some function over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I use a partial scale of yours, all I have to say the expected value of G of sub Z, the whole square, summation of T, that value of S T is like. Right. And this is what we want to find out. This is exactly what this term is. Right. So now I want to say this term evaluates to this thing. But note that GS offset is nothing but this line, this Fourier coefficient, which can also be written as. F of nexus. Uh, y is it? Expectation of y over zero one to the y times by s. Y. This is so GS of z and this are the same things. And this can be written as expectation of f y z times y z y. So now I can take this square root of this. Does this make sense? Yes. I mean, I can uh, still say any questions. Keeping that it's a GS, I'm saying the same as the restrictions. Oh, my God. Right. Is it fun? 
Can you repeat once how you're estimating that? Um, yeah, using Goldrich Clevin. Um, so you're sampling a Z? Yeah. So you're sampling YZ. That's just, uh, you get a random example, mm -hmm. which is YZ comma F of YZ. YZ comma F of YZ. Okay. You get yeah. So you're sampling uh, YZ and Y prime Z, but Y prime Z has to be a query because you want the Z to be the same. Yeah. You want the Z to be first. Um, and what do you get from that? We get one term of the expectation and one term of the other expectation. Yeah. So how many samples do I need to? You need uh, one over epsilon squared, I think. No, just because whatever some is. Shut up. Uh, I mean, it's going to be a function of tau, so one over. So you're already on the sample, sample branch, still on the queries. If you just oh. have queries, if you know your sample is uniformly, you want to y uniformly. So you get y sample is uniformly, and then yeah. for this z, you sample a bunch of y's. The system makes the what's inside the expectation. You yeah. do this a few times, and now you have an estimate of this. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So queries? Queries, is fine. Queries estimate. Uh, some at each node. If it is less than a certain value, chop the tree there. Chop the tree there and continue, right? And continue. And because of Parseval, we know that the number of nodes at each layer is at most one over tau squared. And so, what I'm not doing here is that there's some estimation error and stuff, but like this brush is under the carpet. Sure. Yeah. So, we just modify the parameters appropriately to get that work. And in particular, though, the Goldman level only gives us like a promise kind of thing. But it says if if you have a heavy coefficient, it is in the list. And if something is not in the list, then it is at most its value is at most tau over two. So there's like some gap between what you can assure on both sides. But yeah, you can talk about this uh, after the talk now, like in more detail. But for now, I think we proceed. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, any questions? So, as a thought experiment, now suppose I just chop this after, say, almost log one over tau. Suppose I stop the go right level process here. But I'll get nodes here you know, which have a lot of vectors. So by computing this estimate, it's not really giving me a heavy coefficient because a lot of these things and it's not very helpful. And one of the main reasons for that is because we are making the deterministic like a fixed way of using the prefixes. Right? So from there, tell I raise this. I think at this case we also so, so this is the first uh, uh, item we use, which is pick R of RS. As uniformly random vectors from zero one to n, where s is something we decide short s large enough. And now define each tree as the following. So this is just like one. I'm trying to do the ways to know. Well, it's not what you have to estimate. This is just to zero over the end. This is set up all U, just that U and the R1 is zero. Now, this is set up all U, so U, number of the R1 equals zero. And so on and so forth. And you chose S as log one over tau to uh, spoil the alert. But then 
at this stage after log on all down in the steps. You're saying the tree should be balanced. Sorry? You're saying the tree should be balanced. Tree is balanced. There's no chopping happening anymore. Because if you choose an arm, right, it should put, I mean, take the heavy position. Uh -huh. Is that why? You take, you take the set of heavy positions. Uh -huh. Now, if you choose a random hyperplane, it will roughly put half of them on one side, half of them on the other. Yeah, yeah. But uh, even more so, at the end of log one or how many steps, well, that's just... it will have, uh, if, if this FSS is large enough, each of these will be tiny. We'll have, we'll have at most well, one. Yeah. So, this is structure. Yeah. So, this is the structure. That's uh, a big difference. Can I make an opinion? That's what I'm supposed to do is for a BDA. You don't want to do this. So let's do the S many minutes. The word is. Right. So, as uh, Bruno mentioned, uh, using the probabilistic argument, we can now say that if S is part of log 1 over tau, then each of these steps has at most one vector <laughs> from its kind of uh, this. I guess you can say this is some kind of hash function, and with high probability, it will be one to one on your set. Yeah, I can say that. Yeah, because the number of sets could be larger than number of I mean, it's not be a particle of the So, which at most one of the call squared or something heavy position, right? Yes, it is. I mean, you could just. And are you choosing some hash function? Yes. Yeah. You... Yeah. And, and you apply it to each coefficient, mm -hmm. it'll be one to one in high probability. That's um... I mean, so the number of coefficients will be much less than one of the squared. It's just not about. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So there could be some of these spaces which have none. Sure, perfect. Sure. So all we can say is that most one each of them. So you're not really using anything about the fact that they're heavy coefficients except that that set size is at most one by two. Yes. Okay. That's the only so, far, that's the so yeah. But even beyond well, that, if the function was sparse, it also would be. Right? If the function was sparse. Yes. Oh, but then they're heavy. Yeah. So that's a good point. Get all the... Because uh, so so far this idea also appears in other papers, which has O'Donnell and uh, Gopal and then forget a couple of others, where they use a similar idea for testing sparse functions, testing Fourier sparse functions. Um, but then yeah, the setting is quite different from us because we care about learning and uh, we don't really have a sparse function. Yes. So now, uh, for some more notation, so define capital R as the span of R1 to Rs. So if high probability R1 to Rs are linearly independent. Uh, and next, uh, let V0 be a set of V such that in other words, V naught is the orthogonal space vector space to R space And define V A 
as a set of those u, set u comma ri, those way ri. So what are you going to show? Sorry? What are you going to show? I'm just setting up some relations. Okay, but to show what? To show that for each of these, firstly, what I'm trying to say here is that each of these is a coset of uh, V0. Each of these mm -hmm. spaces is, a, is an affine coset of V0. Okay. What I'm going to show is that I can estimate the max. With so since I know that like uh, each of these spaces has at most one heavy Fourier coefficient, my task has now reduced. Just estimate the maximum value. Oh, in the largest space. Yes, in each space, it's estimated the largest for the So earlier, we had to go all the way to the bottommost depth to have one element in each node. And that's how we knew it's exactly one there and has to be three. But in this case, we don't have such a structure, but we have something as good in our opinion. It says, uh, yeah, there's at most one heavy coefficient in this vector space. So all I need to do is estimate that. So I'm going to show up next. So, so under the assumption that we have this, these arms that isolate a heavy coefficient, you're now going to estimate the largest coefficient. Yeah. Uh, in this, I guess, post it, post it. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. you can say each V A equals V naught plus H. So you have you have a partition of zero one to there into two to the x many affine spaces where each of them is the person of the vector space which is orthogonal to large. Partition of so we can look at it as this way or this way. I mean it's an alternate design. And just a second, can you say that again slowly? You have a partition of zero one to the n of what? So you have a partition of zero one to the n. Yes. Into V A. Into v For A each A uh, and zero one to the S. So there's two to two to the S many partitions of the parts. So yes. Parts of the partition of zero one to the S. Yes. But the point is that each of these part is in fact like a, a coset of the So next, I want to estimate the max value in each such uh, vector space, which has at most one expanded uh, value. So I think I can erase this one. <laughs> Be not as much.
So what I'm saying now is that for any such affine space, which contains at most one element from your given set and is given that type of at least style, the L4 norm of that space can be upper and lower bounded by something which is very close to the L infinity norm. So the maximum value of the Fourier coefficient in the vector space is very close to the fourth norm of the vector space. I think once you go through the group, maybe it's clear, right? Yeah. Is this direction straightforward? Let's look at it. So, so the, the main goal of the statement is to say that uh, for each of those like affine spaces at the bottom, if you want to estimate the maximum for the coefficient, I just need to estimate the total number. Uh, okay, but give me a second. So, but what you're going to do is to get the tau head, you, you somehow need to you actually need to do more, right? Because, um, to take this random, I mean, this root tau error is terrible. Yeah, sure. Root tau error is terrible. We uh, yeah. so you actually do square, you have to square if you want some tau, you have to square or something. Yeah, yeah. But it still goes into the poly one more tau. So yeah, 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 fine. But but uh, I'm correct, right? Yeah, yeah. the system would be terrible if yeah. you're using the exact same tau you want to get in the end. Yeah. So what you do is yeah. to get that all the tau heavy ones. Yeah. You start with tau squared. You start. You start with tau squared. Yeah. Do you mean by start with tau squared? You find the tau squared heavy ones. Square... No, or, or at least you. Yeah. Squared is smaller. So it's a larger set. So like this will give you all the tau square heavy ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. And then each one can individually be estimated. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This will, uh, yes. This will give you all the tau square heavy ones. If and you can estimate this, value, if you yeah. can estimate this value now, but actually in the end you throw away all of those that aren't at least. Uh, you don't really care about the tau squared. You only keep the ones which are tau heavy. Tau squared heavy ones yeah. contain tau heavy ones. So tau by tau doing tau. this process, you might miss some of the tau squared heavy ones, but that's mm -hmm. okay because you're going to catch all of the tau heavy ones. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let's try to explain this. Uh, so, so this direction is uh, easier. This does. Uh, and power of the search and forward and at most the sun now we have had some right now I'll show our direction I mean, this holds for every vector space. Uh, with certain but it's much more general, no? It's something like if you have only one large element in somewhere, yeah. And you sum, I mean, as your four goes to infinity, you're going get, to get here the L infinity norm. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Four is the first one, we can actually get this. But of course, as you increase the norm, you can get better and better approximations. And it will eventually just be done, actually. Yeah. Right. This parsing. So this 
would be equal to F hat and we start to the board you down to the matrix H you down to the H star. This is just a more general statement about the moment, right? Yeah, you can take any set which has one element from your actually no one one heavier one heavier element. one heavy element. and you also have to use maybe parts of others this part of also parser comes in every single place <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah but now this thing can be rewritten as that's how to use uh, Plus and a star squared times yeah. one of the stage, one of the stage, and squared. Why? Because in this set, we know every other element has Fourier math of most tau, three coefficient variable most tau. But now this is at most one again, so we can understand about this. And taking four through on both sides, we get Well, this is that one. So to do this again, so you take the first highest element out, look at the sum of all the rest. And but the important thing here is that every vector has put a coefficient value at most tau. So you can take tau squared out and take the sum of it that will be the whole square for the rest. But possible, we know this is minus one. So what we get is if we take fourth now and like one so fourth root on both sides is just that one fourth of this the L4 norm is at most the fourth root of F hat of U star to the fourth plus star square and the second is the Now that this is the first uh norm for which this actually works because for three this direction does not really hold. And for two we get nothing, right? Like yeah. just one yeah. So yeah, as uh, the norm increases, well, and well, and goes to infinity, we get better and better. Numbers. How do you estimate this? Yeah, so all that is there after assuming you solve it. So, yeah, I can erase the key. Every V not plus H, we have that equal to the expectation X, Y, and Z, sample from V. Now we sample and we know this to keep in mind we know that is span R on the RS, which we don't think.
So the the fourth sum, the fourth exponent of each previous coefficient, you have to switch and get this rest as expectation over three random samples x, y, z, and w chosen randomly from the span of R1 to Rs. Just like we know from the term space, f of x and f of y for z and the sum times this is character by h. Okay. Yeah. This makes sense? Yeah, yeah. And like I've seen this before, so it makes sense. No, I mean, yeah, but I suppose uh, if you want to project, uh, look at the Fourier spectrum mm -hmm. projected to some subspace, yeah. Yeah. what would you do? I and mean, suppose you want to project it to say, uh, uh, I mean, all but x1, x2, I mean, yeah. x3 to xn, you want uh, only Fourier characters involving x2 to xn. I mean, you want to kill all the Fourier equations which have x1 and x2. Which have an exponent x2, x1, and x2. Oh, like the first two bits. You want to remove the first two bits you, of the function. You you are only interested in characters which have which don't have x1 and x2. Okay. Uh because this is a subspace or yeah, yeah, that's the subspace. Well it's a random subspace, but yeah, sure. Sure. but it that, what I'm saying will hold for any subspace. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you just take uh, expectation over x uh, expectation of x. Over just these two variables. Okay. Right. And you, uh, over this vector. Uh, okay. Then what survives is just the Fourier permissions of uh, uh, in this subspace. Oh. Now you take the, uh, now you. Do this trick of sampling it oh, over okay. time independently and then oh for a subspace and I see. Uh because uh it's like you're taking for so taking zero because if these if these variables in the Fourier coefficient are zero, that means you're taking an average. If these variables are excluded, excluded. Meaning, you know, u u one and u two or zero. That's what isn't that what you're saying? If you want u two or zero, I want to take an average over these two variables. Mm -hmm. I mean, if u one is the all zero string, then the true difference is just the average. No, I mean, the, the domain is maximum. Uh, so, uh, uh, Sorry, I thought we were taking the Fourier coefficients. Yeah, so you're interested in the Fourier spectrum, restricted to a subspace. Restricted to a subspace. That might not be a Boolean function. But uh, subspace where? Because uh, here. Subspace in the characters. Uh, right, in the characters, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so now you're, now you're, but this is not plus or minus one ground, right? Um, I mean, uh, I think of them as subsets, so. Uh, yeah, they also have the subspace. I mean, instead of indexing by S, you look at this character, there's that question. Okay. It is going to be very different. Uh, I'm saying something. Mm -hmm. I just started writing this. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you can write the summation of V0 plus H as summation of all S, but with an indicator that S is in the sub is, is S in your given subspace or not. But this can, in fact, be expressed as if you take the expectation of all the vectors uh, in the orthogonal space. So, how do you say if my given vector? Uh, is in my so if a given vector is in my space, I'll I'll take its uh, inner product with every basis vector in the orthogonal space, and if it's all zero, then it's in my space. So that's exactly what this is doing. Uh, 
sorry, what? Um, so uh, a way of checking if a given vector is in, say, this vector space V0 mm -hmm. is by checking if S is in V0, um, if S is not in V0 complement. Is orthogonal to V0 complement. Yes, S is orthogonal to V0 complement. In particular, if you take the basis of V0 complement, which is nothing but R1 to R S here, mm -hmm. and if you check if uh, if this given vector evaluates to zero on each of this, the mm -hmm. number evaluates to zero on each of this, it means that it's not in V0 complement, so it should be free. Mm -hmm. That's all this is doing. You're just checking if the inner product of this is one. If uh, no, you just find an expectation on this given W is in. So you're saying if all these are I's with inner product with my over. Uh, but there's some exponentiation here that I'm not seeing. So yeah, so maybe let me even try to go into more detail. Yes, please. Because uh, once we have this, I won't go further into this because there's a bit of uh, gory calculations. But end of the day, you can just expand this and get to the solution. So okay. this is like the complex. You can just replace each one of them by its Fourier expansion and get rid of. So these are the terms which you get rid of via these terms. And what's left behind this? So example of the LR sort of analysis. Yeah, it's like uh, yeah. You might be aware that, like, in most Fourier settings, the convolution convolution of f and g has Fourier coefficients, Fourier coefficient of f times Fourier coefficient of g, and that's what's happening over there. That f of x at y of z times f of x plus y plus z plus w is the convolution of four f's, mm -hmm. and you can even do convolution with chi as well. Then yeah, and I'm just thinking of it as. Uh... Like the terms which are of different uh, Fourier coefficients, they get cancelled out. Mm -hmm. What's remain? What remains is only only the ones on the same Fourier coefficient s. Yeah, and that's all that remains. I'm sorry, but I mean, okay. So you thought someone thought about maybe it was you, maybe one of your authors, or maybe all of you have thought a bit, a bit about this problem. Mm -hmm. And at some point, they had this. Oh, maybe I can try this. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and then eventually wrote it down, and it turns out it was correct. Mm -hmm. But there was something you thought that uh, made you try this, mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, that's what I want to understand. I, see. I, I must I mean, say, this was my like quarters. <laughs> 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 this is the initial thing of my quarters, but yeah. So uh, yeah, at least the way I see this is, uh, uh, if, if you look at, you want to try this, but try to find the sum. You can split it up into this form. Right, and so these things are equivalent. If I can show this, then the rest are just to make to ensure that you can't remove certain things there. And yeah, okay, but that's still not an image. Sorry, no, it, it's actually fairly common when dealing with Fourier coefficients, multiplication of Fourier coefficients. So just and I also think of it as the company. This particular statement is in uh, okay. like yeah. even in like addition additive combinatorics where you look at the set A plus A. Mm -hmm. Um, people look at it as a convolution and take the multiplication of the Fourier coefficients of the indicator vectors of A. Like this isn't that uh, big a leap for what's which is trick and when everyone do a power you try to trick. Is that yeah? That I mean, whenever you're time? multiplying Fourier coefficients. You, you just write it as uh, f of x times f of x plus w expectation of w. Because the thing is, uh, chi s of x plus y plus z plus w yeah. would just be chi s of x times yeah. chi s of y. So it's minus one to the mm -hmm. thing, right? So you can actually split this. And mm -hmm. the individual terms across these two things. This is cancel out in expectation because uh, because they're orthogonal vectors. Chi s of x and chi say this was chi u of x, they are different orthogonal vectors. Oh. So they cancel out. So the only ones which remain are when s and u are remain the same. So that's why s u. And another thing which I want to say is that this 
this particular quality is in O'Donnell's third chapter. So, uh, so these are, yeah, these are occurs uh, fairly frequently. And it's also, even this thing is not, uh, of course, like viewpoints would change. But as uh, of course you mentioned, like this is similar to again DLR, which is probably one of the first uh, thing which came up with this instead of not having this. Well, even there, you take an off X and with off X plus Y and then a character again to remove some of this. Okay, but the first time that this should appear, you think the person that thought of it had some image in mind other than I'm just gonna. Or or was it a lucky stroke? stroke? You see, because I, I don't think that any, or I mean, whenever I do sometimes think like this, but whenever I do, uh, I usually don't go very far. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, there's some people who are studying much more. The first thing. Yeah, the image. Uh, like what is the image of it? Like how, how would someone even know with this? You have asked him. <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, I've had this feeling many times. Yeah. Time. I mean, to be fair, it's not like. Yeah. Oh, now we do this calculation. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because up to this point, it was kind of all very okay. Mm -hmm. Right, we think of the mass and eigenspaces, and you imagine the space being split into these things, and okay, now it's a hash function, and okay, you know, there's I have mental imagery everywhere, even even this fourth trick, okay, it's the infinity, and then okay, so now they underestimate this. Oh, now there, but now I don't have any, mm -hmm. so that's why I get that. Right? I mean, it's two tricks there. I mean, one is, I mean, if you want to. Now this all this would do is compute uh, summation of s over everything because uh, we can replace each of them by its Fourier expansion and cancel out the orthogonal vectors. All that remain are the ones which are in the same direction, which is just s everywhere. And because of that, the Fourier coefficients just we get the fourth part. But since you want this over your given subspace, you also need to have an indicator for that through which, which you get to the additional chi So you're saying, why you need to the So you can do this. Yeah. So this will be, so f of x, yeah. I can write as summation u, f of u. Times chi u of x, right? x f of y. The value of summation of v, f of v, chi v of y. Next, f of z, the value of s, f of s, chi s, z. Next, f of x plus y plus z. This W will be let's just keep it to the perfect plus y plus C of times E times of I mean might multiply all these things. So only terms which remain under expectation are the ones where you will be S and T are equal. Because the rest are just uh, not how many mm -hmm. That's why you get this F of S to the fourth. Mm -hmm. And to cancel out 
and to actually get x, y, and z, uh, to get cancel out those those terms, you need x plus y plus z. Because it's nothing but chi b or chi b of x times chi b of y times chi b of z. Now, if you take this under expectation of x, y, and z, so these two will cancel out. Sorry, these two will cancel themselves out. These two cancel themselves out. And these two cancel themselves out. Over expectation. Unless you V S and here all you put. So what remains to show is that how you get this indicator, which we can get. Does that make it clearer? Oh. Well, now I at least I've seen the computation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The computation. Huh? Yeah. 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 So if you think of this multiplication of these Fs as a function, a new function G, um, well, include a W in X plus Y plus Z, X plus Y plus Z yeah, plus sure. W. Absolutely. Then the multiplication of these with expectation over X, Y, Z is a function of W function. Expectation C is a function of W. Like G of W is the multiplication of these with expectation over X, Y, Z. So, uh -huh. okay. So these and G is for your coefficients are exactly F hat S to the power 4. These map to each other. So you can cancel these things out. All that remains is this. And then you have the fourth components. Yeah, exactly. So okay. For your coefficients are exactly that. So that also tells you how you can start from there and come to this. Yeah, but I mean, overall, uh, yeah. The idea should get to this stage somehow, starting from here and get things to answer. These are things, again, which occur. Okay, Thanks. and now this we can estimate by some. Uh, we estimate this using again three random examples and one membership thing, right? But okay, going back to the algorithm now, I'm going to erase one thing. Now, algorithm. First, pick Barnard Lawrence. What else? One more time. Then, for each, we may estimate. Right? Mm -hmm. So what have we achieved right now? So in, 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 in uh, Bullrack 11, you have this uh, estimation at each stage, mm -hmm. and then you uh, perform, you either remove the entire tree or remove one. But in this case, you just look at the bottommost layer and one shot estimate everything there. You yeah. estimate max value max using these two, these two statements. But you need queries for doing this. And secondly, most importantly, all we get is the highest value. We don't know what character this is. Because oh. so all this yeah. gives is this value. It just gives the max value of the, uh, of the coefficient in the space. It does not tell you what will start is. Whereas in world right level, you can actually know what will start is. Right. So, so let me let me recap. You just said that one of them is like it's not adaptive or something like that. It uses space. It uses for use for so this uses. Yeah. So you have uh, poly one over tau, many spaces at the bottom, and for each one of them, say you use one over poly one over tau many queries. Right. Because to estimate it's up to solid. Yeah. So overall, 
polyvinyl tau values. You estimated the max value of each Fourier coefficient in each space, mm -hmm. but you don't know the characteristics. Mm -hmm. You have not learned anything apart from this value. Okay, so but this is good already. We have used one polygon of our queries. We've got a lot of information. And but it's also true that it's not adaptive this test, right? Whereas right. yeah. before you had to build the entire tree, go down, but you can cancel some nodes depending on which ones you cancel, you do more queries. That's an adaptive process. Right yeah, here. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, exactly. And so now this is where we all move on to path verification. Now the proof comes in. Proof can tell us what the what the characters. The proof just sends a list of characters. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and now, so firstly, you can estimate their Fourier coefficients using well-known things like just using random examples, estimate their values. Yeah. Right. Now, in the completeness setting, the prover. Well, okay. So protocol. So to figure out f hat of tau, we actually learn f hat of tau over two. And set to be to be four over tau squared. So we ask the prover to send the top t to a position. So it should include all f hat of at least tau over two, in particular also f hat of at least tau, right? So T is, it has to send the T coefficients. Now, so you estimate. So the difference for this is as L hat T, which is the purported list of all the heavy Fourier characters. Right? Yeah. Uh, step one, the two are sent with this. Step two, the verifier computes the to be a coefficient for all the B in L hat B. So let's call this as uh, and following which the smallest one we call it as C hat of lambda. Yeah, C hat of W for Verify a random algorithm one to get nights value for each finally. Uh, if there exists A such that we take the section of the that held in that A with null and So, this is the star, six, seven, eight, seven, nine. Two, two, seven, nine, nine, nine. Two, two, nine. It can't output it. Right. Let me repeat this. Yeah. So I'll ask the prover to send me the top tower to coefficients. In particular, I'll ask to send exactly four over tau squared. It could contain some which have a value lower than tau. It's still fine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we in particular it contains tau with the coefficients as well. Now the verifier for each one of them 
it can estimate its own Fourier coefficient using random examples. Right? And then the verify next ones that are going to, which does use poly one of our queries to figure out the max value for each space. And then it checks if there is one of the spaces which does not contain the list, anything in the list, but then the max value and the smallest value which it has sent are quite far away, then it is because of who is lying. And I'll explain why this works. So, so now it goes over every one of these uh, A fine subspaces. Uh -huh. And uh, I, what I would what I, what I would now imagine is that uh, I now know kind of the heaviest guy on this subspace. I know the heaviest value. I don't know, know the heaviest value. Right, I know the heaviest value. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there's only one. So if yeah. you didn't send me a heavy value here, yeah. I should say you're you're not giving. There's something you're not giving. Me. Yeah. Uh, otherwise. And then I will know, and if, if I pass all these checks, I know that on every mm -hmm. on every big space, it sent me a heavy value, but I know it's only one with very high probability. Yeah. And so you can't be fooling because I tested. Exactly. Ah, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, so what is what is missing still is how to turn queries into yeah. Yeah. And then you have an algorithm. And then uh, the, the, I mean, you have the theorem that you see. Yeah. So is this clear? So yeah, just to uh, like uh, repeat what Bruno said, like if if the honest prover sends all the heavy query coefficients, then we're done because uh, the second thing would never hold here because in particular the smallest value would be larger than everything else which does not contain uh, anything in the list. Yeah, if it's empty, then you're done. Yeah. On the other hand. So the only way a malicious prover can lie here is by skipping one of the three coefficients. Since well, since the list is of size at least four over tau squared, it has to send something whose value is less than tau over two, which means that it has to skip one which, uh, whose value is larger than tau, and instead send something whose value is less than tau over two. But then you skipped. An A star, which contains this element which has uh, large than tau. And, this, and uh, if you subtract something which is less than tau over 2 and something is larger than tau, it's obviously. So you can see Yeah, so in this protocol, you have not ignored any approximation problems at all. Yeah, I have not ignored it. Well, I have ignored it to some extent uh, because uh, here. In the, especially the completeness case, you could still have because of estimations, you could these things to be right. We're assuming the estimations, like yeah, tau by hundred. Yeah, yeah, we can always arrange for this parameter. But yeah, this here. Mm -hmm. So now comes the third sum. I'm sorry, three hours. <laughs> I'll quickly do this and finish this up. Yeah. Yeah, now you can do the query to yeah. random, random yeah. probe. Yeah, yeah. For instance. And for that, we analyze the query algorithm itself, the query construction algorithm itself. Firstly, uh, marginal. So, look, so where are the queries coming from? So these are the random samples, and this is the query which we need to add, right? So firstly, the marginal of each query is uniform. For each query you make, the marginal distribution of the query is uniform. Secondly, as uh, you know, mentioned, it's non adaptive. Mm -hmm. So, every time the, all the queries can be generated in one shot at the beginning. And thirdly, which is the important thing for the reduction, is the property of embeddability. Well, actually, non adaptivity is 
work to use embeddability so this is not really interesting or necessarily i don't know but the embeddability is what we care about which is that so suppose you pick a uniformly random point w from zero one to the end So embeddability implies property of the query construction algorithm where given j query is set to w. We can construct the rest. Maintaining the same property that I have used. So it's not a very, it's a bit like English right now. So, what I mean to say here is that if you pick a J query at random, You pick J uh, and you set it to a string W. Uh, then you can construct the rest of the queries. Given the fact the condition of the fact that J is query itself. And in this case, we can do that. Well, let me not use W. When you when you say the same property as before, you mean it's literally the same distribution as you would have? Marginal is uniform. I guess here it's the same thing. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, so you're saying that condition on the J query being equal to W, uh -huh. the marginal, even the condition on this, the uh -huh. remaining marginal is still uniform. Yeah. And I actually, the, the verifier actually knows something. I suppose, yeah, okay. He actually knows something. How to construct this? In other words, what this is saying is that suppose a verifier picks a random example R from an F of R. The verifier can hide this with query set. In such a way that when the prover looks at the query set, it sees, oh, this is uh, what the verifier would have constructed uh, based on based on its randomness. And then answers all the the prover in particular, verified in particular, asks the prover to send answers to each of the queries. But since the prover does not know what this R is, because the distribution of each one of them is uniform, and you're picking this also uniform, rather this random example is also uniform, the prover, you'll catch this line. But it is enough to hide one? That's kind of surprising to me. Yeah, it. so it repeats multiple times. Okay. So you generate a query set, by adding one, and then you repeat this thing. Like if the number of queries is you repeat this too many times. Yes. So sample complexity block is quarter. Yes. Yes. So this is uh, yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And uh, here uh, we are using this fact. The prover does not distinguish between uh, individual queries. Because the prover can uh, yeah. unbound, like a malicious prover is unbound, it can look at individual queries and figure out if the distribution is actually uniform or not by looking at multiple mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. And non adaptivity is used by better people. So it's unclear if this is really necessary. Oh. It's easy to put embeddability when you have non adaptivity. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier. And yeah, so we're done with this. And the last thing is uh, for the XA0 parity, we show this embeddability in a more general setting where we don't assume the margin is uniform, but it comes from this analytical set design. And uh, we can embed this example into the set, like into the PRG construction itself within the scene. We can fix this within the scene. And uh, the learning algorithm for CIKK is nothing but the design reconstruction. So if we can fix the seed inside through this, then we can embed the queries as well, and then do all this. So we, in some sense, that there is even more generalizable with respect to the margin as well. 
doesn't need to be uniform. So what yeah, currently yeah. works is, is that the underlying distribution over which you're learning and the margin of the query is the same. Yeah. When you start with this in case, the underlying distribution is uniform, the marginal is different. It comes from the same design. Okay. It's still uniform over a bunch of bits, but still, yeah. So yeah, again, how far can this go is an open question. So what is, how far can we go with embeddability framework? Uh, what are the limits and uh, describe sample reduction? Like what is, uh, what can we do with this? An open question, so I can use it. Another one is the basis of a priority. Uh, you have a uh, multiplicative and hypothesis. Can we do something less less that like currently we're just using CIT as a as a black box? Mm -hmm. Just running it and using the transform samples. Can we use some more properties of basis of priority? Follow an approximation to get the correct value. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't that just give you a better learning algorithm itself? Right. We need to use a prover. Right. But the yeah. prover, aren't you seeing that the prover is, um, is bounded? Yeah, but I'm, uh, malicious is one, isn't it? It's a slightly, again, you, know, you also have like random examples. Because I mean, so just learning cases of variety of random examples, even the prover is bounded. Uh, which still mean that you're learning. No, actually, no. Because, right. because the tool is using failures. So doesn't mean that. you're just showing the qualitative situation. Yeah. Oh, um, no, but, I, but I, what I thought is that this poly, poly, uh -huh. poly one word touching uh -huh. in the air uh -huh. factor uh -huh. came from the original learning algorithm. Yeah. Which is what the prover is going to be running. Yeah. Right. So. Oh, I'm saying you get a better learning algorithm itself. No, I'm saying why? Because yeah. what you're saying is you're trying to. I think the line of what you're saying was can we use the the, the power of the prover to yeah. improve on this error? Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're assuming that the prover itself is efficient mm -hmm. in some sense, mm -hmm. then the prover is not going to be able to do better than the best efficient algorithm. Sure. Yeah. And that one has this. Factor of error. Yeah, yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess yeah, the model here with the prover is given the hypothesis. Can you generate a proof efficient in yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. So that's also yeah, one can think of it as like uh, a like server, like it has computed a good hypothesis for some functions which are more popular mm -hmm. and stored them somewhere. Mm -hmm. Then now it has this like stores and it just ends with this. Can you still do this in Yeah, I'll stop. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. 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 Sorry, it went on for a bit longer than <laughs> I imagined it would. That's something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this must be. Uh, Right.